I, I'm a chemist, right? I'm a photochemist who is interested in bioanalytical uh, applications. And I, I, I need to give you a disclaimer. I, 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 um, I'm going to take uh, the science rigor down in Neutra too, because the, the, maybe I was misled into believing that this is a more sort of general um, crowd here. And uh, so I'll, uh, what, what we're interested in, we've developed a uh, uh, photolabile systems. There is my title encoding and screening of solution phase combinatorial libraries for drug candidates. So we developed a, a photolabile systems, which are binary systems and break some bonds upon radiation only conditionally, upon some condition. And so today my task is to convince you somehow that uh, we're now ready to uh, uh, fundamentally transform the field of combinatorial encoding and screening. And this is our humble or not so humble goal right in here. Before I do that, though, I, I, I need to give you some background and history on, on, on things involved. And it's really all about amazing diversity and molecular recognition, right? We, we heard a lot today about uh, this kind of thing. So all these cartoons, which show all kinds of you know, complex biological cascade signal transduction and um, enzyme uh, substrate interactions and so on, they all boil, boil down to molecular complementarity. Right, so there is, if you can see here, there is this ligand, and there is a protein, which may be enzyme, maybe a receptor, and there's a cleft in this protein. So the, the term, which is operating in uh, uh, lock and key kind of uh, uh, modus operandi, right? The ligand fits perfectly in, in this cleft, not unlike the, the key fits into the lock, right? And the lock and key concept is more than 100 years old, right? So Emil Fischer, who, who is actually the, the second recipient of Nobel Prize in Chemistry, right? Uh, he, he got his Nobel Prize actually for something else, but working on proteins, he long recognized that this, this kind of lock and key uh, analogy. And this, you know, in 1894, it wasn't that easy, actually. And in, in the year preceding his uh, lock and key discovery, he was actually captured by an unknown artist working hard on his lock and key concept here. And as you can see, it was <laughs> trying all kinds of lock and this lock and that and said, I can just sense how close I am to the lock and key. So the, 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 the good news is that now we know a lot, a whole lot of molecular, about molecular recognition, right? We know how molecules bind to each other, all these hydrogen bonds, by stack and all kinds of uh, non-covalent interactions. And then the second part, of course, in modern drug discovery is actually synthesizing things, right? Synthesizing molecules and so on. In the dark ages, chemists and alchemists were doing it sort of at a leisurely pace. And if you look at this guy, he's really incredibly content, right? He's relaxed, working his little reaction. No comparison with my contemporary, how worked scientists, you know, <laughs> under deadlines and so going and so on. And, uh, and, you know, the, the, in, in the olden days, they would go to nature to, to, to get some drug candidates, right? To, to, uh, this is, that uh, will make this uh, recording PG-13, I guess, but this is, no, don't hold it against me, that's Graham Patrick, an introduction to medicinal chemistry. The, 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 this is a famous dynasty, right, of, of physicians, and they, their cure for epilepsy was uh, heat a cauldron of water until warm to the touch, then hit a liberal sprinkle of juicy spiders and produce one pedigree dot. You know what's coming next, right? Uh, and, uh, and 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 and, and uh, uh, simmer for 20 minutes, then enjoy. So, my my point is that some of the things actually work, believe it or not, right? <laughs> but my point is that the pace of the discovery was so slow, right? And with all this diversity of proteins, all this diversity of, of targets, there is no way you can provide uh, a sufficient number of drug candidates, right, for, for, for modern uh, drug discovery, unless you employ some sort of high throughput combinatorial synthesis, and high throughput is the key word, right? So that's that's a sort of definition that it's automated synthesis of large number of compounds in short time period using defined reaction route and a large variety of reactants. And normally carried out uh, 
Um, as a solid supported synthesis using all kinds of robotic uh, sensitizers. And there are two types of um, hydrofluid combinatorial synthesis, parallel synthesis and synthesis of mixtures. And the parallel synthesis both use actual robotic synthesizer. That's several of them are shown on this slide. So the parallel synthesis is all about syn uh, syn synthesizing single product and each reaction groups, right? So I'll, I'll give you a quick example again, the synthesis of 27 tripeptides. This is all possible tripeptides of three amino acids, right? So the first step, you immobilize is blue, red, yellow, and so on, and 27 wells, reaction uh, ves vessels, you immobilize the first uh, amino acid residue, then the second, then the third, and finally, you clip them off, and you have all 27 tripeptides in 27 vials, vials. but you, you, you just, um, uh, the, the number of reactions that it took like, was 81 reactions, right? Okay. So, automated parallel synthesis is really an engineering achievement. All, we did, all we've done here is we created uh, a, a, an army, small army of robots, and then just miniaturized them in, in, into some robotic synthesizer. So there is no glory for chemists, right? It's the engineers who, who, who did this. So uh, the, the fundamental, the parallel synthesis is no different from this old age old uh, method of synthesizing compounds, right? Because if you, if you need uh, a thousand compounds, you will have to run your reaction in a thousand flasks, a thousand reactions and so on. So chemists, of course, uh, came up with a real ultra-high throughput combinatorial synthesis, which is a synthesis of mixtures. And this is all about synthesizing mixtures of compounds, and it's very useful, actually, for finding lead compounds, right? <laughs> okay, so here's an example of the same 27 uh, peptide synthesis, only now we're going, again, we're going to use three amino acids, say glycine, alanine, and beta, right? And synthesize the, fir the, the first step, uh, we synthesize, we, we just immobilize it to the beads, mix and split, and two steps, we have all possible dipeptides, then again we mix them together, split them into three uh, vials or reactors, and glycinolin and valine, and as a result we have all possible tripeptides in three, in, in, in three vessels, right? Uh, now we have the same 27 peptides, but we synthesize them using only nine, nine steps, right? So nine reactions. If, if, and th if, if this is not impressive, we can think in terms of all 20 amino acids, for example, synthesizing hexapeptides, and six steps using 20 reactors, we can synthesize a staggering number, 64 million products. And this is the robotic synthesizer I'm talking about. Um, um, th this one is installed in my lab. It's a graduate student operating it. The reactor block here actually is six by six. So we have 36 uh, reactions at the same time. So overnight we can produce two billion compounds easily, right? So that's a real high throughput. The question is how to screen for biological activity or how to screen for bite. That's where the bottlenecks are, right? The combinatorial libraries screening the one bead one compound type of screening is uh, the way it's done now. <laughs> Uh, you uh, outfit your uh, target protein with some sort of fluorescent, uh, fluorescent compound, and when this target protein finds its ligand, what it, uh, this multiple copies of protein uh, are attached to the to the bit, the bit becomes brightly fluorescent, right? And then in the dark ages, that would be about 15 years ago, they would use literally uh, forceps and microscope and you know mechanically separate the winning bit, winning bits. Now they use um, uh, some cell sorting equipment right, uh, based on fluorescence again. But the main point here is that this requirement of mechanical separation puts the low limit on the size of the carriers that you can use for this kind of things, right? And this is too bad because uh, combinatorial chemistry based on nanocarriers, for example, dendrimers, uh, has a lot to offer synthetically, okay? So people know how to synthesize libraries of protein, uh, libraries of all kinds of metal, uh, of all kinds of ligands uh, based on detrimers, for example. There's no way of screening them. You cannot just take a five nanometer dendrimer and separate it mechanically. And of course, when we're talking about uh, solution phase real molecular mixture, solution phase of combinatorial libraries, there's no way of doing it. Again, you cannot just, you cannot uh, mechanically separate. And so our point here is, 
that the, the idea of screening millions of compounds in one soup, in one swoop, is very appealing. And in my view, the only way to do it is to chemically encode the library members. And then uh, here, where are we coming? So there are a couple insultingly simple slides uh, showing what uh, our photoinduced pre fragmentation can do. So this, this is a standard uh, sort of scenario. There's a photo uh, photofragmentable bond. You shine light, and bond breaks, right? It's, and at some point, uh, we, we, we started thinking about what kind of extra functionality we want here. What can we offer beyond this simple model when we shine light and one breaks? And that's what, uh, what we want to do is the conditional photoinduced fragmentation. That is, we shine light, all day long nothing happens unless the system is binary. So it requires a sensitizer uh, in the immediate proximity of this uh, photolabile bond to, to, to clip the bond. So now we can make it conditional in some molecular recognition events, which brings in the sensitizer in the immediate vicinity of this bond. And then you radiate, you accept <coughs> the sensitizer, bond breaks, and you release something which, in the context of this uh, presentation, is going to be a tag, for example, a binary tag for combinatorial encoding, right? Uh, I'll skip the uh, mechanistic studies, just you'll have to take my word for it. We, we, We've studied the mechanism and so on. What's important here is that our photolabile, binary photolabile system is based on this dithionine addicts, which are photoactive only in the presence of triplet benzophenone, right? And triplet benzophenone triplets live like seven microseconds in, 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 in solvent, so plenty of time to approach and, and break them up. And what we have is a clean fragmentation releasing the dithionine, which you can uh, encode sort of with the alkyl chains of the second position. We've proved the concept that we can trigger photochemistry with molecular recognition using this photoactive barbiturate receptors, which, are, which were inspired by Hamilton's isophthalyl disaminopyridine motif. This on the left, uh, what you see is the sensitizer is a part of the macrocycle, in which case the barbiturate is carrying some payload and we can prove that the photochemistry happens only in the docked state. So when, it, when, it, when, when it's docked, then some photochemistry happens, and this thing can be released. On the right, you have the opposite situation when uh, um, the, uh, it is the photolabile fragment, which is the part of the micro microcycle. And it is the barbiturate which brings in the sensitizer. And if you think about it, this is your ultimate lock and key system, right? Now we have, finally, we have the key, which actually unlocks the lock. And here is uh, Emil Fisher, the ghost of Emil Fisher, sort of. <laughs> I hope uh, uh, his, he approves of our uh, lock and key uh, interpretation. So back to the combinatorial libraries. <coughs> Instead of outfitting the receptor with the fluorophore, what we're doing is we're outfitting it with a sensitizer, right? And all the ligands in the combinatorial library are encoded with all these dithane tags attached through the photolabile bond. So we solubilize the library with the help of uh, misulforming uh, uh, detergent like DPC, and then uh, incubate it. The actual binding uh, brings the sensitizer in the immediate vicinity of this photolabile fan, at which, key, at, at which point the irradiation commences. And as you can see, only the tags which are encoding the successful bound ligands are released in the solution where they can be analyzed and uh, the, uh, the identity of this ligand can be revealed by analysis of this. Uh, this is a quick uh, synthetic scheme. This, uh, the synthesis is reasonably simple. What, to prove the concept, we, we went with the uh, archetypical biotin avidian system where we know that biotin is going to bind, right? So the biotin was encoded with a series of dithionines, methyl hexyl and nonyl dithionines. Here is binary encoding thing. Very simple to read from right to left. The methyl is present as one, no ethyl, no propyl, yaddy yaddy. Then the, there, there's hexyl, one, no, no, nine, right? Decimal 289. Then some glucosamine. It was a mini library which in which glucosamine is encoded with no methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl, decimal 14. Carboxylic acid was encoded with another binary. Uh, number. So the main point here is that dithionines, uh, the, the, the very feature of dithionines, which makes it 
amenable to photochemistry, that is the stability of ketine radicals and, and that mechanistic scheme that I uh, sort of browsed through, uh, makes them also very suitable for detection at very low concentrations. Okay? So I can show you, uh, this is uh, what happens when you just inject methyl through C9 dithyenes at 0.5 picomol per injection, right? So it's 5 times 10 to the minus 13 uh, molar concentration of dithyenes, and we can confidently detect them with a spectacular signal-to-noise ratio here, right? And uh, the, the key word here, this is not your state-of-the-art technology. We want to make it available in dirt cheap, right? So this is your garden variety GCMS. Which, which was sitting, it's a bit up actual high garden variety GCMS that we have, right? So when you uh, incubate the library, you radiate and, and um, uh, subject the hexane extract after photolysis to the same GCMS, all you can see is these three peaks now, right? And you read from right to left, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, and so on. And that reveals that the, the biotin was the culprit, but we, we of course knew that the biotin was the culprit. Now, this is the, um, this is the uh, uh, proof of concept again. So now what we're doing is we're synthesizing a um, large libraries of protein, of, of, of polypeptides and enfolding them dynamically as a part of, as, 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 um, as the synthesis goes. And for that, what we need really is, uh, here's the trital resin that we're using. So we're encoding, we, we're attaching first this, what is in-house name is the fork acid here, where FMOC uh, protected amine is the center for uh, the handle for the peptide synthesis. And this N3, which is the azi, is used for reduction of tritinophosphine and then orthogonal sort of chemistry and orthogonal encoding with the stars. Now, the last thing I wanted to mention here is that we sort of, we, we had the last obstacle that we needed to um, overcome here was the fact that at every step we use this advantage of solid state synthesis, solid supported synthesis, where you can use excessive reagents and so on to wash them. Uh, the azi to encoding with tags will have to be partially reduced. And say for, for, uh, for a pentapeptide you need to reduce only 20% of the azide at each step. And, and that is very difficult to do assuredly, let me put it this way. And then um, all of a sudden we realize that we now we can we can use actually this marvel of intelligent engineering, right? The the, the uh, uh, sensitizer not to, to solve actually some of our chemical problems. So instead of partially reducing 20% of the azide, we can distribute, pre-dispense 20% of bits into each of those reactors, individual reactors, and now assuredly uh, reduce them with this triethyl phosphine, TAG1, TAG2, TAG3, TAG4, and so on, and then dispense the rest of those things, right? And do the standard FMOC deprotection and the peptide synthesis, and so, Again, here you have you, you, you can use the um, excess of reagents and so on and uh, um, mix them for the second step and, 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 and proceed with the synthesis. So that's where we are. Of course, there are, sort of, there are many details, but I, I, I probably uh, ran out of time at this point. So uh, <laughs> if, uh, if, if anyone is interested in details, you can, you can go to our web page and see, and see there are some publications listed and so on. Uh, at, at, at this point, we better stop, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. There is, there is another, the delicate, of, delicate art of molecular disassembly, these are all muscats. Questions? Are you quick patenting this technology? Hmm? Are you going to patent this technology? Yeah, that, that, that's patented already. So the, the actually the um, the WO came out, the international came out this year. So with the, the initial filing was uh, in 2005. So now we progressed far enough for this to to feel confident. So I guess I again I need to thank the. Um,
life science discovery for, for support of this 